Welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you've joined us today. My name is Sarah Bunin Benor, and I run the HUC JIR Jewish Language Project. And today we are honored to have with us uh, Rena Lauer to speak about Jewish women's wills in the pre modern Mediterranean. And this event is sponsored by the HUC JIR Jewish Language Project and a grant from HUCJIR in honor of the 50th anniversary of Rabbi Sally Presan's ordination. And it's part of a conference organized by Jennifer Grayson in Cincinnati at the HUC campus there about Jewish women's labor. So let me introduce our speaker today. Rena Lauer is Associate Professor of Medieval History and Religious Studies at Oregon State University. She got her PhD at Harvard in 2014. She writes about the intersection of gender, law, and religion. Her book came out in 2019, Colonial Justice and the Jews of Venetian Crete. In 2021, she started the website jewishwomenswills.org and that's what we've asked her to speak about today. So she's gonna speak for about 12 minutes or so about Jewish women's wills, and then I will uh, interview her, lead a conversation about the specifically the language in the women's wills, and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A. If at any time you have a question, feel free to click the little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and you can add, ask your question there. And uh, we hope you enjoy. Rena, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to my home office. You're joining me in Corvallis, Oregon. Um, it somehow seems very appropriate to have you in my home because wills, one of the reasons that I love wills is that they really blur that line between the private and the public. So welcome into my private public space. First of all, thank you so much to the Jewish Language Project, to Sarah Benor, to Jennifer Grayson at HUC, um, and to HUC, a, a very hearty congratulations on this really celebratory moment of the 50th anniversary of Rabbi Sally Preeson's ordination. So I think it's fair to say uh, that nearly no one likes to think about dying, but humans have long put aside that deep discomfort with death to get our affairs in order. In fact, writing wills has a very long history. 
The oldest surviving will found so far is from Egypt, from about 2550 BCE, so that is over 4,500 years ago. But for those of us who study Europe, uh, it's really in the 12th and 13th century when we suddenly have an explosion in the writing of the document that looks familiar to us as a will. The rise of widespread, easily accessed municipal notaries, who are basically lawyers in charge of writing contracts, gave a rising middle class in the medieval world, and then soon anyone with any means at all, the opportunity to record formally and legally their formal, uh, their final desires. So from the very early days of this explosive will writing phenomenon, Jews got in on the act. In fact, Jewish will writers can actually be found even earlier, before the year 1000 CE in the Muslim world. In Europe, we have surviving Jewish wills, certainly from the 13th century onward. And perhaps most exciting for those of us who study Jewish women, many Jewish women, many Jewish will writers in the Middle Ages were indeed women. We tend to think that pre-modern women wrote so little that we could hardly hear them. And it's certainly true that when it comes to medieval Jewish documentation, prescriptive elite male sources dominate the field. We might think of Gluckel of Hamlin's late 17th century memoir as one of the very rare cadre of intentional female writing. So wills actually provide us with something remarkable, access to women's choices, women's agency for hundreds of years before we might expect to be able to read women's words. I first came across Jewish women's wills when I was doing research for my first book about the Jews of Crete. Crete's Jews went to local Catholic notaries in droves for every kind of contract you can imagine, to sell wheat, wine, cheese, to rent houses, to betroth their children, and indeed to leave wills. The wills were striking for a number of reasons, including the fact that there were far more wills written for female Jewish testators. That's what we call a person who leaves a will, a testator. Uh, so there were far more wills written for female Jewish testators than for Jewish male testators. So after my first book came out and COVID struck, I began collecting Jewish women's wills from wherever I could find them. I chose 1650 as an end date, since it seemed to me that after about 1650, the number of Jewish women's wills really exploded. Um, and also scholars have already paid a lot more attention to the wills that come after about 1650. So this was the birth of a website called jewishwomenswills.org, which you can find online. Uh, it's very much still a work in progress. So let me just share my screen. I absolutely hate sharing screens, but I will share the screen for a moment just to give you a, a small sense of what it is that you can see and find on this on this website. So what you're already looking at here, let's take you to the to the uh, fir first front page. So what you're seeing on this is simply a front page that offers you an image of of one of the wills, one from Crete. And you can search this website by looking at individual items, but I will just show you what it means to look at individual collections. So the way that the wills are organized is mostly thinking about language. So vernacular Jewish notarial wills mean wills written by Jewish notaries, uh, but in a vernacular. So let's say Spanish or uh, Roman Italian. Grecophone wills are those written in Greek. Romance vernacular wills are wills written in the Romance languages, uh, but by Christian notaries, and I'll talk a lot more about that. And then we have Hebrew notarial wills, Geniza wills, they're known here as dispositive documents, responsa wills, which are wills that are known only because they're in the Jewish responsa, and then Latinate wills, and I'll talk a lot more about wills written in Latin. So. Uh, I just want to show you one more thing here, which is that you can browse here. Let's actually do it this way. You can browse by tag. So each will is not just, well, here, let's, let's peek at a will. Um, let's look at a Hebrew notarial will. Let's choose something at 
uh, at random. So here's Fiore, we may talk about her. So this will does not have an image or a transcription. This is a will that I know about, but I don't have a great deal of information about. But let's say you wanted to look at wills that you knew that there was going to be a translation into English. So you could simply browse by tag, go to translation, and find, for example, a will from a woman who testated in 1470 in Girona. And here you'll have a, an extensive description of the will. And then as a, an attached file, you will find a translation of, of this will. Um, this happens to be a, a translation actually into Spanish, but we have many, many wills on here also that are translated into English. Okay, so without further ado, I'm actually going to uh, stop my, my screen share. And I invite you to spend more time looking at, at the website at, at your convenience. It is, it is still very much a work in progress. It's an imperfect uh, platform, which I'm happy to talk about more. But in the meantime, uh, Sarah asked me to join you here today to actually talk about language. So this is the Jewish language project after all. So let me turn to think about how wild these wills are in terms of language. So, there are currently 235 wills visible to the public in the website's database. Um, my guess is that over time, we're going to find that the numbers of surviving Jewish women's wills are far larger, maybe even at the, uh, may, we may even break a thousand. I actually would not be surprised. But of these 235 wills, the vast majority, over 70%, are in Latin. Latin wills were written for Jewish testators by Catholic notaries working under local or state rules. And the Latin wills uh, that we found so far have come from a variety of spots, mostly from across Western Europe. So from Italy, Sicily, Southern France, Spain, and Venetian Crete. As we move to the later period, some Christian notaries began to write in the local vernaculars, including Spanish, Portuguese, and Venetian. And then in the Greek-speaking East, some Jews went to Christian Greek notaries writing in that language. But not all Jews went to Christian notaries. In fact, you may be wondering why Jews went to Christian notaries at all. Weren't Jewish notaries and rabbis a better choice? Aren't non-Jewish wills halakhically problematic. So of course, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A, but I will say that late medieval and early modern rabbis were increasingly comfortable with non-Jewish wills. Nevertheless, uh, the fact that we don't have a lot of pre-modern Jewish made wills surviving is actually in large part an issue of survival destruction of Jewish communities often came with the destruction of Jewish documents, whereas surviving Latin wills were generally preserved in safeguarded state archives, which is actually where we find them today. And in fact, when we have Jewish made wills, those are really an accident of survival. So some survive in the Cairo Geniza. Uh, I know of 18 Jewish women's wills from the Cairo Geniza in the period before 1650. Um, and at least one Jewish women, women, woman's will uh, in Hebrew from Spain survives because it was reused as scrap paper to bind a non-Jewish book and then was found by scholars in that format. We have a much more robust set of wills from Jewish notaries in Rome, which survived because they were saved in the Roman Capitoline archives, so state archives. And although these were Jewish notarial documents, they were approved of and essentially licensed by the by, by Rome, uh, which blurred the lines between the Jewish document and the secular one. So these Roman Jewish wills are particularly interesting from a language perspective as well. We'd expect them to be in Hebrew. And indeed, for much of the 16th century, this is true. But starting in the 17th century, a number of Jewish notaries began to write in Roman Italian. So Jewish notaries by 1600 thought of the Roman vernacular, this kind of Roman Italian, as a legitimate language for official Jewish documents, even as they carefully followed the strictures of Jewish law alongside the formulae that kept these wills valid for the state as well. Of course, what this all means is that there were many more Jewish notarial wills, uh, whether in Hebrew or in the local vernacular, 
that have not survived. So to be a historian of these documents means we have to be extremely sensitive to the fact that any statistics we try to use about numbers of surviving wills and their language breakdown, for example, that correlates to survival, not to production. Okay, because I promised Sarah that I would keep my opening, uh, my opening words brief, let me turn to one very short case study about language and wills. So the main premise of my analysis of wills, um, and as I described it earlier, is that it's a kind of document that actually lets you hear a woman's voice. This is actually a problematic statement that I've just made. Although wills often present themselves as being in the first person, and often they begin something like, I, Perna, very ill, but sound of mind, called in a notary, in reality, there's a great deal of boilerplate and formulae. Uh, the notary had an enormous impact on the structure and perhaps even the content of the will. Likewise, a woman likely had family and social pressure on her when deciding what to include in a will. Nevertheless, I argue that we can actually discern real and significant female agency in the will. So uh, as I sometimes say, even if we can't directly hear her voice, we can certainly hear her choice. I know it's a imperfect rhyme, but meaning we're hearing agency and choice, even if what we're hearing only purports to be the actual voice of the testator. So let me offer um, a very small language related piece of evidence for this claim, one that involves some interesting and unexpected code switching. In general, a will appears in a single language, but we have some unique cases in which the change, a change of language mid will uh, seems to hint that we're no longer hearing boilerplate, um, which is often written in the high official language, and that we've moved closer to the voice of the testator, um, which is usually written in a vernacular. So at least in one case, this is very explicit. We have a 12th century will from Malij, Egypt, in which a woman named Naima is on her deathbed, and she calls in the Jewish notary to write her will. So the Jewish, the Jewish notary writes the beginning in Hebrew in the usual boilerplate, uh, like the fact that Naima was sick but sane. That's legalese that is needed to prove that the will is valid. But at the point where Naima begins dictating her bequests with specifics, the language suddenly switches to Judeo-Arabic. That's Naima's spoken language. So instead of taking notes in Judeo-Arabic and then bringing it back to his studio and translating it into Hebrew, uh, which would have been a process that would have further created some sort of mediation between uh, the reader and Naima's voice, the notary simply maintained the language of the testator's dictation. So I'm not claiming he didn't clean it up, but I am suggesting that the choice to maintain the spoken language in the will does allow us some more direct access to Naima's voice. A second example of the same phenomenon is a bit less explicit, but I think maybe more telling. In the late 15th century, a Christian notary recorded two wills belonging to Jewish women in Trapani, Sicily. The notary recorded both wills in Latin, but nobody was speaking Latin in Sicily and hadn't for a very long time. They were speaking the Sicilian dialect. Most of the body of the wills, uh, including most of the bequests, are in Latin, which means that the notary likely took down notes in Sicilian and then later translated into formal Latin. Yet in each of these two wills, there are moments of sudden shifts into uh, a Latin that's deeply inflected by Sicilian. It's practically Sicilian. And importantly, this doesn't happen at random moments, but rather at moments of very high emotional tensions. So both wills, which are both actually from early in 1486, suddenly turn to Sicilian when considering who should replace the testator's young daughters as the universal heir in the case that the girls die young, which is a very heartbreaking thought. And then in one of the wills written for a Jewish woman named Stara, another clause also suddenly turns to Sicilian. Stara was married uh, to a living husband when she testated in 1486, and she seems to have had serious concerns for her husband's mental state. She left instructions for the will uh, for what should happen to her daughter should her husband not be of sane mind. 
And the section dealing with these details, where the girl should live, how she should be financially supported, is suddenly heavily, heavily inflected with local Sicilian vocabulary, syntax, and even a phonetic spelling. So again, I'm not arguing that we're suddenly hearing a direct voice from the testator, and I have no doubt that the notary mediated and polished what he, what he wrote even in, in the Sicilian, but it certainly seems like we're getting much more of the testator's direct dictation here, and the notary's choice to record in the vernacular certainly seems to symbolize that shift. And I would argue that perhaps this is happening in moments when the testator's specific emotional opinions seem to the notary to be most important, or in which he didn't want to mediate too much for fear of misrecording the desire of the testator. So my point here is that considering language shifts is but one of the ways that may allow us to see nuance in the will uh, and allow us to hear Jewish women and understand their choices more effectively. So let me stop my initial presentation here to create space for conversation. Uh, I'm just going to conclude this portion by saying I'm thrilled to be discussing JewishWomen'sWills.org uh, with this audience and particularly with the Jewish Language Project because I think that thinking about language is an extremely important tool to think about how Jewish women approached making wills and dying, uh, which actually tells us a great deal about the worlds in which the women lived. Finally, it's a good reminder that to be a Jewish language, a language simply needs to be one that Jews were more comfortable utilizing in their everyday lives. So thank you, and I'm very happy to, to answer questions. Thank you so much, Rena. This was great. We learned so much, and uh, I'm sure we'll all learn a lot from the conversation we're about to have. So uh, my first question is, can you just tell us a little bit more about how you got interested in this topic and how you um, realized that there were enough wills to make a collection like this? Absolutely. So let me start by telling you a little bit about my absolute favorite will. It's another heartbreaking will, um, but it's the will that absolutely gave birth to this project. It comes from 1373, and it comes from a woman named Harana on Crete. I discovered this will as I was working on that first book on Venetian Crete, and I'll just say that there happens to be a guy whose name is Joseph, who I knew everything about. I mean, I felt like I could see this man's dirty laundry. I knew about his business interests. I knew about his bigamy. I mean, I really knew a lot about this man, and I knew very little about anyone else in his family, and suddenly I start reading this will, and I discover it's his sister. It is the only piece of information that we have about her. That in itself is fascinating to me, because as I am a scholar of gender trying to get at women and women's voices, I was able to see in such stark relief how much material I had about a man, Joseph, and how little I had about this woman, Harana. But what made this will so fascinating is that Harana wrote the will while she was dying in the midst of labor. The will tells us this. So she was literally in the middle of labor. It was clear that she was not going to survive. The will says nothing about the, the fetus. So it's clear that there was no expectation that the fetus, the baby, would survive. But somehow, somebody has the peace of mind to call in the notary. And she indeed gives a great deal of information about how to how to divide her her assets. So this was fascinating, first of all, because of this world that it opened us into this world of uh, of the, the dangers of pregnancy and the, the dangers of of sort of living a woman's life. But also, I had all these questions. We have this will that seems to come from Harana, but let's say after two or three days of failed labor, how much is Harana really? going to be the one who's who's answering the questions how much is her family whispering in her ear or even answering for her and so it sparked a great deal of questions about the agency in these wills so that particular will was so interesting to me but i think in terms of recognizing that there was something there um in in crete alone we have 114 jewish wills from the let's say 1312 to like 1529. I love, it's very precise. So we have 114 wills. About 70% are female. 
Uh, that's 77 wills. And so suddenly I said, oh, is Crete an outlier? And I started looking around doing research. And actually, we have similar percentages from places like Aix-en-Provence. And suddenly I realized there was something out there that that needed to get explored and had had hardly been explored. That's great. Yeah. And that was kind of the impetus behind our Jewish Women's Voices exhibit in the first place, um, where we, we have an exhibit of documents that were written by women um, from the 10th century through the present in various Jewish languages around the world, including songs, which are a big part of Jewish women's productivity that still remains because they were recorded throughout oral traditions uh, through the generations. Um, but let's let's talk a little bit more about language now. Uh, so you talked about the shift from Latin to Italian in the, the 1700s, um, and you mentioned a little bit about Hebrew wills. Can you tell us a little bit more about Hebrew wills and also specifically the responsa wills? Absolutely. So Hebrew wills are an interesting phenomenon because we actually don't have that many of them. Uh, in fact, I only really know of, of a handful beyond this collection from Rome. And the ones in Rome, we have nine. So we're not talking about huge numbers. Um, as I said in my presentation, I think this is a product of, of survival. I actually think, and this is something I'm happy to, to address more, I think we have more men uh, in general writing wills in Hebrew going to Jewish notaries. In part, that's because Jewish law about inheritance is very male-centric. Uh, Jewish law really sort of only imagines somebody leaving inheritance as, as male, and so they have very specific rules about how a man has to leave certain portions to specific children and take care of widows. Um, but certainly men are also going to, to Latin notaries and, and, and Christian notaries. Um, the thing that I think one of the things that makes the Hebrew will so interesting is that the people who are who are testating are not speaking Hebrew. So even the Hebrew wills sometimes give us a hint of the kind of vernacular kind of uh, conversation that underpins the will. The will is this is this document that flattens everything to some extent. You know, there's all this conversation happening in order to produce the will uh, and a conversation that's happening probably in families and then on the deathbed and then probably when the notary goes back to his studio and does his polishing and then comes back to the family and says, is this what you heard? So there are all these layers. And so we have sometimes in these wills, in the Hebrew, echoes of the vernacular. So I'll just give you one, one example that I, I love. Um, there's a, a will um, written in, in the 1550s uh, by, well, for a, a Jewish woman named Fiore in Rome. And she's talking about how little she has. She has very little stuff. She has a mattress, a bedstead. Um, and she says, and she has some rags. And in Hebrew letters, it writes stracci, rags. So you know, I, I'm thinking about like, what you know, what word would I use? Certainly I come up with the Yiddish word schmata, you know, it's sort of like, so this, this word rag is something that for the, the Hebrew notary, it makes sense to just simply use the Italian word. And so he just sort of inserts that. So from a language perspective, even the Hebrew wills start to involve this bit of, um, of the vernacular. Um, and if you, you don't mind, I will say just one more thing about the Hebrew wills. So the thing about writing a will with a Christian notary is that you have to have something to leave. That may seem obvious uh, that you go to, to write a will if you have a, assets that you care about. We have this interesting phenomenon from these Hebrew wills in Rome that suggest that people sometimes went to the Hebrew notaries because they could basically say, I have nothing. I want to write a will in which I have minimal stuff and I'm leaving you, I'm leaving this will because I want my family or my, in this case, you know, sort of my naughty nephews to know that there's really nothing, there's nothing to fight over. So wow. the Hebrew wills have a sort of flexibility that the, that the non-Jewish wills don't. So the Jewish wills tend to have a kind of flexibility in terms of what the document can or cannot say that the non-Jewish wills don't have. Hmm. And um, do you want to say more about responsa? Oh, um, simply that 
responsive wills are so fascinating because they're anonymized. So we have the, the real the wills that I have that are responsa come from the Ottoman from an Ottoman context. This is something that there are there are scholars who who definitely know a, a great deal more about this than I do. But there's there's sort of a an interesting sense in which the will is meant to provide a model because they're meant to answer much broader questions to be applied broadly. Whereas the the notarial wills all have this extremely personal component. And so I think that might be an interesting way to, to sort of contrast Hebrew responsa uh, wills versus Hebrew notarial wills. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about other languages. So you mentioned Latin and Italian, a little bit of Sicilian in there and Hebrew. Were there, oh, and you did mention Hebrew and Judeo-Arabic. Um, were there other languages, Jewish languages with Hebrew script represented, like Judeo-Arabic in Hebrew letters and uh, Judeo-Italian in Hebrew letters, Judeo-Catalan, that kind of thing? So not yet that we've found. This is really a, a tragedy of survival. There is no doubt in my mind that wills were written in all of these languages, and maybe we will find it. So one of the one of the wills I mentioned to you was found in the the so called Girona Geniza, which is basically Jewish documents that were found because they were reused as scrap paper, often as as bindings of books, and. Otherwise, we have very few Hebrew documents from Girona. So certainly Spain is a, it probably doesn't surprise us knowing what we know about the first sort of set of massacres of Jews in 1391 and the expulsion of Jews from Spain in 1492, that when Jews are, are kicked out, often their, their documents are destroyed too. And I'll just mention that one of the reasons that that's true is that alongside wills are other notarial documents like debts. And so if Jews had been giving credit to Christians who were then involved in, in massacres and attacks, they one of the things that often happens is that when, when attackers would come in, we know this from places like York, England even, they would come in and people would be killed and then they would intentionally destroy and burn these chests, uh, which is where people kept their notarial documents. So we have so few Jewish documents that are in this sort of notarial vein because they are actually intentionally destroyed. Hmm. So we have thus far, I know of, I actually know of no wills from before 1650 that survive in Yiddish, for example. Um, I have, so Elisheva Baumgarten is uh, an expert on, on women in Ashkenaz and um, she and her, she has this wonderful group called Beyond the Elite that's working on kind of social history of Ashkenaz in the Middle Ages. They're based at Hebrew University and they've been doing extraordinary work, but thus far, I nobody's found a will. So I, well, let me say this, I invite the audience to prove me wrong. If there are those out there who know of wills from before 1650 from in, in these languages, I would be thrilled to be proved wrong. But right now, I would say that we have a serious tragedy of survival on our hands. Yeah. So can you say a little more about where you found all these wills? And uh, I assume you want people to send you ones that aren't yet in your collection so you can expand it, right? Yes, this is a collaborative project. This is absolutely a collaborative project. So the wills that I individually brought from archival research are, are the, the wills from Crete. And I have a, a team of collaborators who you can you can read about also on, on the website who, excuse me, have contributed wills from their own archival research. It also happens to be that lots of scholars of individual regions, say a scholar who really just spends her entire life sitting in the archives in Ferrara, or who sits in the archives in some small town in Sicily, oftentimes they will publish in some obscure local journal a will, a Jewish will. And so this is kind of why this has been a COVID project, um, because I've been just scouring all of these small periodicals, these small journals to try to find evidence. and. Sometimes it's successful at this point. The, the, so we're at about 235. And I think that 
we're sort of at a, a slow trickle pace. And so I'm very eager to expand the, the collaboration. And I really am, am very happy um, to be, again, to be proven wrong, to, to have my assumptions questioned. And I am, I feel like I'm constantly reaching, reaching out. I'm, I'm sort of that person who, I, if you're getting an email from me, I'm probably saying, by the way, P.S., do you have any Jewish women's wills that you've found? Um, and it, so you this, is, this is, on, your, you could add that to your email signature. <laughs> I know I probably should. Um, that would be really funny, actually. Uh, so I, I think, I think at this point, this is a lifetime project. One of the things about JewishWomensWills.org is that the idea of doing this website is that it allows a, sort of a, a very flexible, constant expansion and growing. So I'm also doing analysis and, and writing in conventional kinds of ways. But the idea here is that we simply don't know how many exist out there. And it may be that somebody finds themselves sitting in a local archive somewhere in Spain and suddenly comes a across a, a cache of these documents. And my hope is that people will start to know about JewishWomensWills.org so that the person sitting next to them in the archive can say, hey, I know where you should send that. I know who you should be in touch with. Yeah, that's great. And we do have some people attending today who do research on related topics. So perhaps they'll be able to send you some additional wills. Um, and then, uh, so based on what you've already collected so far, what would you say is the geographic distribution? Um, you probably have more concentration in Italy and Crete because that's where your research is focused. And you mentioned um, people doing research and publishing in local journals in Italy. What about other countries? How many wills do you have from various places? So this is definitely a Mediterranean phenomenon so far. I would say that we have a good a good number of wills coming from across the Mediterranean. Um, you're right that there is a bit of a, a skew towards the Italianate sphere, including Crete. I'm I'm curious though if this might be actually not simply my my own bias. I think that this is a, a very common Italian Jewish phenomenon of of people Jews. Jewish women writing wills. Um, we also have a number, quite a number from Spain. So this is interesting. Um, Jews writing wills with Latin notaries or later vernacular notaries. Um, and those are in state archives. And so that survives. I would not be surprised if there were many more Spanish wills. I I don't know what's going to happen with Cairo Geniza wills, you know, whether we're going to find more. Certainly the, the Cairo Geniza is this big puzzle and people are constantly finding new, new fragments to put together. So we may, we may find more from, from the Muslim world, from Egypt, from Fustat and Cairo and, and the hinterland. So there's, there's a lot more to, to do. I will say that I have a very capacious definition of Jewish in the context of Jewish women's wills, which means that um, with, with the guidance of some of my collaborators, the wills include conversa women. So we have women currently uh, who testated in Portugal, for example, who identify as conversa, as new Christians. And so we may find even who knows, uh, we may find new world wills that kind of fit into this category. Those are not, we don't have those yet, but that would absolutely fit into the purview of jewishwomenswills.org. Yeah, and I, I like how you talked about voice and choice before. I, I do see that as a perfect rhyme, by the way. Um, <laughs> And, and, and this, this relates to our broader collection of Jewish women's documents because often women didn't have the ability to write and so they're representing their choice and maybe even in their voice, but that the, there would be a male scribe. And, Absolutely. And, and, and yeah, so, but how, how do you know, uh, do, do the documents you have say the name of the notary? Yes, almost, okay. almost okay. uniformly. Um, of course, in the Latin ones, it's presented as if I, let's say Perna, I, Archantisa, called in such and such notary. Oh, okay. uh, occasionally, we even know how much she paid him or, you know, how much the family paid him. So the notary is is always listed. Um, and the notary is listed also alongside witnesses. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there are Christian witnesses, sometimes Jewish witnesses, sometimes both. So 
yeah, we definitely know, we know a good deal about the notary and we know a good deal about notarial practice. So we, we have a good sense of what, what is boilerplate and what's not boilerplate. Yeah. Um, and it makes I will sense, oh, sorry. It makes sense that there would be boilerplate language. I, I mean, we do that in our wills today. You have to have some, that there are legal requirements for what needs to be included. And, and nowadays we can just look online and find a template or call a lawyer who has a template that they use for all their clients. Um, but I wonder how standardized that was in various empires and uh, countries in the periods that you're looking at. Sometimes, so this is a wonderful question, sometimes the boilerplate after you've read a couple of them becomes obvious. So the fact that everybody needs to say, I'm sick, but I'm still sane. You know, you you know very clearly, very early on after reading just a few wills that that's there because otherwise the will is not valid. After reading a few wills, you also know that everyone is going to say in some form or fashion, usually even in Hebrew wills, because no one knows when they're going to die, but no one wants to die without their affairs in order. I got my stuff together and I'm, you know, I'm calling in the, the notary. So there's a lot of this boilerplate that you even start to suspect the notary probably wrote before he even showed up at the house. Mm. But there, excuse me, there's all of these, there are all of these pieces of boilerplate that you don't necessarily know if it's just the notary's tick, that particular notary's tick, or if it's something personal. So there are some notaries who will call every wife a dear wife or every husband, a beloved husband. And so at the first time you read it, you think, oh, maybe there's something there's something very personal here. Maybe it is that this, this, this couple had a particularly sweet relationship. And then you read four or five by the same notary and you're going, oh, that guy just always calls the wife dear and the, the husband beloved. Yeah. Yeah. And also, so with, that's, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say that's a challenge, but we have other ways of assessing the fact that these are really the individual woman's strategies. Yeah. Like what? So um, one of them is the kinds of conditions that they put on some of their heirs. So for example, um, well, here, I'll give you a, a funny one. So uh, one of the Hebrew wills, uh, a woman doesn't have any children, so she actually pays her neighbor's son to say Kaddish for her. And she leaves him some money. Um, and she says, you know, I, I leave this amount of money for, for saying Kaddish, but only if he says it. So you get the sense, this is not a, this is not a boilerplate. This is not a typical statement. So you get the sense that there's some, you know, there's some, there's some question and some anxiety that she has. You sort of actually feel that she cares about this and that she's adding a condition to make sure that he really does say Kaddish for her. Or in other ones where uh, Jewish women, this actually is very common in, in Spain, such as in Zaragoza, Spain, uh, Jewish women have children who are Jewish and children who are Christian. And we see the ways in which they decide to divide their inheritance as a way of sort of giving commentary on their approval or disapproval of the children's decisions. Wow, that is amazing. And I've been watching Rough Diamonds and I see a lot of parallels. So I don't want to give away too much in case you're not yet at episode four. But um, so, uh, okay, some other questions. Uh, were, were these wills written by single women or widows? Or were, do you also find any jointly written wills by married couples? So this is an excellent question. I would say that the majority of wills that survive are widows. When we have women who are still married, we don't know what the illness is. They don't tell us, but they're they're either very ill or pregnant. This is a phenomenon uh, of sort of the the pregnant testator is actually not something that's terribly widespread. Scholars of the the broader world say, oh, this is a Venetian phenomenon, but actually we we see it among Jewish women even in the Cairo Geniza. So I think this actually might be something that Jewish women were inclined to do. So when we have younger women, they often are either very ill or pregnant. Otherwise, many of the women are widows. Single women, occasionally, but again, only if they're, they're very sick. Now, do we have double wills, couple wills? 
very rarely. And that's because of Jewish law that says that you really can only write your will if you're very sick or if you are in extreme danger. And extreme danger is often defined as either pregnant or going on a pilgrimage. So going on a big journey. So for example, I have a, a grandmother who is uh, going on pilgrimage to Israel, to Jerusalem, and she doesn't actually plan to come back. This is in the 14th century. And so she leaves a will, even though she's in great, I mean, she must be in great health. She, she says she's in good health. Um, so, but to, to write a, a, a double will would generally be something that would happen in a moment of health. It's, it's kind of a, a long-term planning uh, action, the way that today couples will, will plan in advance. But those medieval Jewish wills were very much oriented towards, towards the deathbed. And so, and therefore, generally no. Got it. Um, well, let's turn to some audience questions now. We do have a bunch of questions. And again, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A section. Um, so Rabbi Joan Sachs asks if any of the wills are ethical wills. I love this question because every time um, I say I'm working on a wills project, they say, oh, ethical wills. I mean, that's because that's what people generally know. To some extent, we even um, we, we generally assume that when we have wills in the Middle Ages, they are ethical. And in fact, so I said I have a very capacious definition of Jewish women, but I guess I have less of a capacious definition of of will. Um, although I haven't found any women's ethical wills from this period. So again, Gluckel of Hamlet is kind of a famous case uh, in which people see her memoir as actually stemming from the, the model of an ethical will. But no, there, there are none. Um, if one were, if someone were to know of women's ethical wills from before 1650, please, please do tell me. Oh, but it sounds like you, you did find a little bit about their ethical uh, expectations for leaving their family based on their stipulations, right? Yes. And so this is the thing about a will. A will claims to be an economic and legal document, but a will is an emotional document. It is a document in which people are consumed by what's going to happen after they die. And what that means is that they're very consumed with their with their children and the emotional lives of their children and, and the well-being of their children. And people are willing to do extreme things like um, I have a will in which uh, a woman has four children. One of them is severely disabled. And she says to her other three children, they must support and take care of the fourth child. And if they don't, she's disinheriting them as close to disinheriting as you can get. In fact, in a pre-modern world, you have no choice but to give a minimal uh, inheritance. In fact, modern day Chile has the same, a lot of, a lot of places whose, uh, whose legals, where the legal tradition comes out of this medieval Mediterranean legal tradition still have that. But otherwise she, she disinherits her children and says, all the money is going to somebody else to take care of your disabled brother. So, this is absolutely uh, a document that uses the, the boilerplate of economics and law to engage in a great deal of, of moral and ethical speculation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so Marjorie Grayson asks, from your talk, it is clear that women held their own property. Well, I know that in England and the U.S., married women did not own their own property until the mid to late 1800s. So how much did married women control their own property? Good. Okay, so thanks, Marjorie. So this is this is definitely a question. So certainly, if we were talking about, uh, yes, England and the U.S., we'd start talking about coverture, and we'd talk about the fact that women were essentially a, a legal appendage of their of their husbands and earlier of their fathers. It happens to be that in all of these contexts, both the Geniza context and the Mediterranean context, women have essentially two kinds of property that they have of their own. So meaning married women. So one is the dowry, which they're actually not controlling during their lifetimes, but that comes back to them and is is legally theirs. And then they have extra dotal gifts that, that their families are able to give to them, which they can directly control. So we have, we have women who are in business uh, and, and don't necessarily need their husband's approval. So this is 
a very different model than than the model of coverture. What yeah, this is define? I agree. This is an interesting. Can you define those words coverture and extradotal? Sure. Extradotal just means outside of dowry. Sorry. Oh, okay. So meaning they're, they're generally like two kinds of things that a woman brings into a marriage, stuff that counts as dowry and stuff that counts not as dowry. Okay. Okay. The stuff that counts as dowry, her husband has control of during the marriage, even though it's technically hers. The stuff that's not considered part of the dowry, she actually has some more direct control over. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then coverture is this legal principle that really did actually obtain even some places in the U.S. until, God, the 1970s and some state laws that essentially a, a woman has no independent legal person personality outside of her husband. It's also kind of the, the premise upon which the, you know, the idea that women shouldn't vote is based on, you know, th that statement that, uh, you know, when a woman votes, it's just two votes for her husband meaning she's just giving her husband a second vote. So it's it's that it's that legal premise. But that that is not um, the product of the kind of Roman law tradition that inflected Mediterranean law. Okay. Um, so Ruvain Firestone says, um, thank you for the fascinating presentation. I'm interested in deepening our understanding of the volition and success of women engaged in inheritance details. I was under the impression that this was virtually a male monopoly, would love to learn more. Um, you may have addressed that to some extent, but maybe can you also talk about that in terms of uh, different religious communities, like if you come across um, Christian and, and Islamic um, wills written by women and men and Jewish in, in these periods that you're looking at? Yes. So let me let me address this in in a way of thinking about the question of success. So um thank you, Ruvain, for this for the question. Um one of the things that seems to happen, and I'm not sure if this, I'm not sure if I'm going to directly answer your question. So if, if you want to follow up, definitely please do. Um, but one of the issues with wills is that we get this snapshot of what somebody wants and we have no idea what happens afterwards. Um, and so one of the things that makes Jewish women different than say Christian women in particular is that women have the choice to write a will in more than one forum. So a Christian woman has no choice essentially but to go to a Christian notary. But a Jewish woman could go to a Christian notary or could go to a Jewish notary. And as I suggested before with the, the that Roman case of the very poor woman Fiore, um, people have different motivations to go to different kinds of notaries and write different kinds of wills. So uh, a Jewish woman um, may go to a Hebrew notary if, again, she has nothing, uh, or if, let's say, she doesn't trust the local system. On the other hand, what we seem to see is that Jewish women do trust the, the state systems, which are uh, which use the Christian notaries. Jewish women think that maybe that's actually more uh, more likely to, to lead to better enforcement of their wills. Um, so I'm not sure if that if that directly answers this the question, but certainly we're talking about what's called forum shopping, this decision about, making a decision about where you actually go to have your will written. That's that's a choice that Jewish women have that others don't necessarily have. And Jewish women are definitely maximizing the utility to use these economic, uh, to use this economic language, that they are definitely choosing the place that they think that they're going to get the best enforcement. Now, are all wills enforced? No, of course not. I mean, anyone who's read any court cases from the medieval Mediterranean knows that some very large percentage of court cases are actually fights over wills. In fact, some wills that we have are only recorded because they're recorded in the court case. So that's another place where we find wills uh, sort of tucked into court cases. So, but that's not, that's not a, a woman issue and that's not a Jew issue. That is a, a wills issue that lots of wills are contested and deemed unacceptable or problematic by, by family members. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, this is from Tybal. Has this project changed your approach to writing a will and uh, the content of wills and the frequency? I love this question. 
it certainly it certainly makes me think a lot more about our fill in the blank wills today. And it also, I will admit, makes me want to write a separate ethical will. So my father is actually on here somewhere. Hi, Abba. Um, but uh, he and I have talked about this, this idea of writing an ethical will. And I think that what I see in the medieval wills is that there's space. There's much more space, both in the Hebrew and, and the Latin wills, to express some of that kind of ethical messaging. And I'm not actually sure if that's quite as available in our modern deeply economic oriented wills. And so it actually maybe makes me want to consider, please may I have a very long life that I may not have to think about this until 120 years. But I do think that it it really highlights um, the need to pass along to our next generations a much more explicit message about what we what we value and what we hope they value. Yes. That's great. A great way to end. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Rena. This was excellent. And we learned so much. And now I'm going to turn it over to Hannah Pressman, the Director of Education and Engagement for the Jewish Language Project, to tell you a little bit more about some of our upcoming events and some other ways you can get involved. Great. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. On behalf of HUCJ, our Jewish Language Project, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for attending today's event on Jewish women's wills in the pre-modern Mediterranean. Thank you again to Professor Rena Lauer for being with us today and providing a fascinating perspective on this topic. Part of the Jewish Language Project's core mission is to regularly convene experts across disciplines, as well as speakers and heritage learners to share their findings and thereby raise awareness of Jewish languages, both their rich history and their current precariousness. We provide these programs to the public free of charge so that all can come and learn. The Jewish Language Project is a nonprofit organization and we rely on donor support and grants to keep our initiatives going. That's why we're inviting you to be part of the movement to preserve Jews' precious linguistic heritage and raise awareness about Jewish cultural diversity. Sarah's going to drop the link to our current fundraising campaign into the chat. You can also reach the fundraiser by clicking on the donate or volunteer button on our homepage. We're already 25% of the way towards our goal of raising $20,000 to sustain current programming and create new resources. Any donation gets us closer to our vision of making a world of Jewish languages accessible to everyone. Today, we'd especially like to acknowledge recent gifts by Tybal and Abraham and Rabbi Amy and Gary Perlin. Thank you so much. I'm happy to share about two events coming up soon. The Jewish Language Project is a partner for the first ever Unity Through Diversity event on Sunday, May 21st. This global celebration is taking place in honor of Jewish American Heritage Month and will feature many speakers and artists, including Dr. Benor. Also on Sunday, June 4th, we're excited to partner with ECAR to present a panel discussion about Hanchi, a new Israeli television show about an Orthodox woman from Brooklyn who makes Aliyah. Two linguists and two stars involved with the show will share insights about the role of language and related topics. Anyone who registers for this event will receive exclusive access to the first four episodes of Hanchi with English subtitles. And it's recommended to watch the episodes before the June 4th panel to get the full context of the discussion. Please check our events page for all the details and registration for these two events. There are lots of ways to plug into what's going on at the Jewish Language Project. Our website, jewishlanguages.org, has a large collection of exhibits and resources. We have a Redbubble shop with all kinds of fun items like mugs, stickers, shirts, puzzles, and more. All merchandise proceeds support our initiatives. And if you're not already following us on social media, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Just to highlight one series we've been sharing over social media lately, since Passover, we've hosted a multilingual Omer counter. Every day we share how to announce that day's Omer count in a different Jewish language, ranging from Judeo-Catalan to Jewish Swahili. The Omer Counter, as well as weekly fun facts, 
and gems from the Jewish English lexicon are shared across all of our platforms. So definitely check them out and join the conversation. The very best way to keep up with all of our activities is to subscribe to our email list for occasional updates about events, programming, and research. Here at the Jewish Language Project, we believe that there is a world of history in every Jewish language, and each speaker has something to teach us. Thank you again for joining us for today's program. Take care, and we hope to see you soon.